All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, to the last slot in the attack and research track. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about ad networks. And this is Raphael. Raphael, stage is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for everyone to be here still up awake um, for the last talk of the day. And I will try to not uh, put you asleep now. So um, I'm going to talk today about ad networks and uh, like how terrible they are and like how insane uh, web development is nowadays. Uh, so originally, I was supposed to give this talk with uh, Quinn Norton, who is freelance journalist and writer and uh, was, is slash was um, UI UX designer um, past in, in the days. Um, and so she, she knows stuff about UI, UX, where I have absolutely no clue about that. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, mostly developer for Circle, uh, so I mostly develop tools around um, like incident response for my colleagues at um, Interface. And uh, I'm sorry, you will have to endure my uh, French accent, and she is not here, so she will not be able to help you with that. Uh, but yeah, I will try to keep, to keep it relatively understandable. Uh, yeah, and we are also InfoSec trainers, so we will do some trainings to like a bunch of people, like mostly journalists, but also some companies and so on, on information security. Uh, and the reason Queen is not here today is because uh, that's what happened to her um, uh, not long ago, like two weeks ago, she had like uh, three, uh, three discs replaced in her neck. So yeah, it was two weeks ago, she wasn't really able to move uh, and to come to the two troopers uh, this year. Uh, but still, she says hi. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, originally the project was um, in New York uh, around six months ago, six eight months ago. Uh, we were giving a training to a bunch of media lawyers, and it turns out that uh, once in a while you end up seeing a news saying that some ads network were compromised by some random stuff. Um, so and like it's always really amusing for like the um, competing company to report on something malicious happening on like on some um, uh, some competitor. So like you always have like New York Times reporting on BuzzFeed being compromised on the other around NBC and like I mean it's always really amusing to see them like um, yeah making jokes about the other network when um, yeah when themselves are not compromised. Um, and it uh, turns out that uh, we were discussing with those media lawyers, and we told them, you know, your websites, like all of them, there is like no exception, all of them are running dozens of random stuff and like on like just ad networks that nobody knows what they are doing. Um, and like we're asking, like, do you want to do something about it? Like, do you are you aware of that? And uh, what what are you doing to fix it? Uh, and that was roughly their answer. Um, like, they know it's a case, but also it's really hard. Like, there is no tools I know about that was able to help them just figuring out what was going on when you have, like, hundreds of URLs loaded from, like, dozens of websites, dozens of ad networks. Um, and like you want to investigate into it, like just there is no there is no easy way for them to investigate. Uh, don't re don't forget that they are media lawyers. They are not technicians. They are not like they are not instant responders. Um, and their websites are huge, so it's, they just have no way to do anything really with it. Uh, so they were like, hey, can you help us then? Because we don't have any way. Can you do something about it? And yeah, we we're like, that's yeah, uh, sure. I mean, we will need to think about about it because again. I, I was not aware, and I am still not aware of any easy tool for non-technical people to investigate those websites. Um, I mean, you can talk about uh, like some um, light beam, for example, in uh, in Firefox, but that's like that's not really reproducible and really not particularly useful for those kind of those kind of cases. Um, so as I said, we have really complex really big websites, like the front page of, uh, of websites like uh, New York Times or BuzzFeed or like Le Monde, Spiegel, can go up to 10 megabytes. So you have like a lot of JavaScript images, stuff that are loaded um, without any like, just you cannot investigate all of that at once. Uh, it's also extremely dynamic, meaning that depending, like, when you reload the page multiple times, you will have, like, a bunch of different calls every time. Um, like, the JavaScript will be loaded from remote website and can be changed without uh, their knowledge. Um, 
Again, third-party components are coming from everywhere. Um, and most for news websites, most of the third-party third -party components running on those websites uh, are the ones that pay the bills. Like, very few people pay for news, so that's why they have all those kind of all those ad networks running. Um, and as I said, auditing like there is no simple tool to audit those websites. If you know something about it, we can discuss about it like at the end. I would be really happy to, to hear about it. But there is nothing that I didn't find anything um, that was useful for them. Um, and as a third operator, I handle I like I handle a lot of cases involving phishing websites. Like it's just super common, like the, the uh, Google uh, Gmail uh, login page or the uh, PayPal or um, like just Google Docs, whatever. Like so. Phishing websites are just happening all the time. Rel often they are relatively simple. Like it's just like a page hosted on some like compromised WordPress that that looks like vaguely like the websites are trying to impersonate, um, or uh, it's just like a simple redirect to like to a domain controlled by uh, by the by the attacker. But sometimes it gets like much more complicated. Like you will have like dynamically generated JavaScript that will do call out to like a bunch of websites, and then it's going to be like you will have five redirects in a, in a row and so on, and then it loads some like um, in URL base 64 encoded content, um, which is like none of that is new, none of that is completely unexpected, but it's just really annoying to analyze. Uh, and to reproduce uh, to reproduce those cases, like if you have like depending on the user agent, you will have different kind of stuff that will be loaded, uh, depending on like when you do it, when you do that, how often you do that. Your source IP might also be um, uh, be checked, and you will just sometimes only see uh, the phishing website once or twice. Um, so if your colleague was using the same, you just you just end up on like Google.com instead of the, uh, the actual phishing websites because they were redirecting you. Um, so it's just really tricky to reproduce and to figure out um, what's going on on a phishing website that is like well done. Also, most of us have uh, the newest browsers, like we have the most recent Chrome, the most recent Chrome, the most recent Firefox, uh, and uh, we will run like all kind of ad blockers and no scripts and so on. Meaning that reproducing um, like attacks on an older browser or uh, having all the JavaScript running and just like seeing what's going on for like the user that was reporting the, uh, the phishing case to you can get really complicated. Um, and again, you can do that. Like I'm not saying that it's impossible to do. It's just, it takes, it takes time and it's really annoying. Um, so what we want is a way to Get the, get the URL, run it in, like, in a complete browser that interprets everything, JavaScript, uh, load the iframes, load the redirects, uh, get all the cookies, get all the headers, and just like, you need to run it in, a, in an actual browser. You want to keep the data set you generate out of this run for further analysis later on. Um, having a screenshot of the page is quite nice because this way you can actually see what's going on. Um, on like the full page, because sometimes you just have like the uh, like the first like the first page you would have in your browser. You want really you want to see really the whole uh, the whole content. Um, and having the full HTML of the page that we loaded is also handy. We want something that is easy to deploy because again, if it's something complete, like if it takes you half an hour to uh, to set up your environment to do the to uh, check the phishing website, well, you may just not do that, or you may just like decide to do it later and forget about it. Um, we need to have a flexible way to pass parameters, and by parameters I mean a user agent mostly, uh, because m like relatively often, the, depending on the user agent you you are passing to that to that website, it's going to redirect you to different things. Uh, something that looks legit, because we we all we all have like a virtual box running Windows XP and Internet Explorer 6 somewhere on our machine, and uh, we can just like load, try to load something in it. But like as you know, IE6 is not really like supported by anything anymore, and it's just really easy for an attacker to say, yeah, just add this one in the list. I'm just going to like redirect you to Google, and you cannot do anything. And we want something that is relatively easy and like simple for a human to use. Um, because again, if it's a really complex website loading a lot of stuff, 
if it takes you a while to just like figure out what's going on, it, it's going to just like you will lose time. So uh, that's where I found uh, two tools that are like really cool for that. Splash, which is an um, instrumented WebKit, meaning it's like a really recent WebKit. Uh, so you can just uh, send a URL to it. It's going to load everything, interpret the JavaScript, and uh, like the same way Chrome or Chromium would do. It, let, it lets you define a user agent. Um, and you can also um, set up the depth of, uh, of the, the crawling. So you can just like send a URL and like get the whole website and see what everything everything that is um, going on it. It will take take a screenshot of the website, and it comes in a Docker image, which is just pretty cool. Uh, you just you don't have to install anything because it's a lot of uh, Python. And yeah, if you if you just want to run something simple and fast, Docker image is going to make your life way easier. Um, and the really cool thing is that it's going to return you an HAR, so HTTP archive file that you can actually work on. Uh, the reason I made it a library is because um, Scrappy and Splash, uh, so Scrappy is the one that you like crawl the website, and Splash, Splash is the browser. Uh, it really wants to run in a dedicated um, process, and I was like, I want to connect all that stuff into like other tools, so I just want to have like a library that I can just give a, give a URL, does the magic, gives me the output, um, and just like not care about it. So if you want to just like add in some of your, um, in another project, something like, like that, just giving a URL, getting an output as an HIR file, and processing it, just use that, that library. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, yeah, so uh, I was talking about HTTP archive document, HTTP archive. HTTP archive is a standard that is going to um, give you like a list of all the requests and all the responses coming from all the servers that uh, this URL was, was loading. Uh, so that's what I'm going to, that's like all those requests in the, in the HTTP archive as everything that was uh, loaded from anywhere uh, based on the URL you passed. So it's like a nice, uh, nice way to check that you are actually processing everything and that when we will generate the output, we'll just like see how, how useful that, uh, that part is. Uh, the HTTP archive contains all the header, all the cookies, all the redirects, and also all the bodies of every responses uh, of the wall, um, of the, like everything you loaded uh, as independent um, parts. So you can just like at the end get, uh, get like a specific body, like a specific output of like what, you, what has been downloaded from any server you were contacting during, this, uh, during the, the load of the page. Uh, so it's really handy, we'll see later on for investigation. Uh, the thing is on news websites, that's a lot of entries. That's like hundreds of entries really, really easily, really often. Um, I have some website that load like the front page is going to load uh, around 800 unique URLs. Uh, not all of them to third party uh, websites, but like a lot on uh, third party websites. We will have like examples later on. So that's like what that thing is. Like when you have the whole HAR file, that's a dumpster fire, and that's yeah how you feel when you see the the output at the beginning. But let's dig a bit more into in the HAR file. So two two um, two keys in those files are really interesting. The redirect URL is going to tell you okay this URL was loading this uh, is redirecting you to this second URL. It's the location key in the in the HTTP header. And the other one is the referrer key again the HTTP header. The referrer key means that all the URLs with this referrer key uh, in the header come from, or I mean, it can be, it can be uh, modified and so on, but it at least gives you an idea of like where, that's, where, the, uh, where the URL is loaded comes from. So that's just like, looks like a tree, right? Like you have something loading something else. Um, that could be represented as a tree. So that's how it's going to look like for a simple website. Like I just pasted security in Luxembourg in, um, uh, in, uh, in, my, uh, in my search query. It's going to redirect me to uh, the encrypted version, so the HTTPS version of the website, and it's loading all those, um, those subdomains. Simple, clean. That looks fine. But well, in practice, there is a bunch of interesting stuff going on here. 
um, the redirect key can be anything from the full URL to just the parameter, so everything coming after, like the semicolon in the URL. So you have to, when you get um, the location header, you need to reattach all that stuff to the URL that was calling it. So, for example, if you have like you load uh, security made in LU, and then you have uh, in the location header just a file name. This one is going to be the path to attach to uh, the original uh, domain you are loaded. Uh, and that's all completely normal way to do redirects uh, in, uh, in a website. Uh, and something I discovered is that you can also just pass a query. So if, if the uh, location header contains um, a semicolon on something, it means that you need to get the whole URL cut at the first semicolon and attach what you had to the location header. And then you have uh, your whole URL. Interesting. I didn't know that. It's disgusting. But yeah, web development. Um, also, sometimes uh, the location header will contain the port number. I guess it's just to mess with you. Like at this point, you have like something, you have like a URL, and they decided to enforce the port number. Sometimes 80, sometimes 443, because, you know, reasons, I guess. So you need to like strip it out, because in my um, HR file, um, the URL loaded will be like the full URL and not just like a part of it. So I need to like do uh, reattach everything to be able to find out uh, what is connected to what in my tree. Uh, and as I said earlier, the referral header can be stripped because just, of course, it can. Uh, so you, don't, you will end up with like a bunch of URLs that you cannot really attach in your tree anywhere. Again, dumpster fire. Um, and then you have iframes because, of course, also iframes. I mean, I didn't really expect it to be a thing, but turns out it's everywhere. Uh, you have iframes everywhere, and all those iframes will be able to load other iframes, redirect you to other two web pages containing other iframes, contain JavaScript, uh, read set cookies, and just like everything, like just pick one and put it in your iframe, something will happen. But the cool thing is that Splash is going to give you uh, a tree-like format with all your iframes, so you can just like have all the URLs, attach it to your tree, and have a nice view and figure out what is loading what uh, from your website. So that's pretty handy at this point. Um, but still, that was not enough to attach all the URLs I had in my HR file. So, of course, I end up using regexes, so I just like get all my bodies of all everything I load. I get, I look at the body. Uh, have I have a, just a regex looking for URL-like string in all my bodies, and if I find it, I just attach it to my tree at that point. Um, so it's um, it works, um, and but still, I have like a bunch of URLs sometimes that are I guess loaded. Um, uh, yeah, that I, I, uh, that I guess loaded by um, uh, by like a JavaScript dynamically, and I don't really know why. But uh, they are not like I don't have any clear referrer on like where they come from and what has been loading them. So I will just attach them at the end to my tree as orphan URLs, and we will see it later on uh, in the examples. It's um, it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so. I hate reinventing, uh, reinventing the wheels. So, as I did with a Splash and Scrappy, uh, to, having, to use a tree, I found a library called ETE Toolkit, um, developed by a bunch of biologists uh, to represent phylogenetic trees, meaning that they have the whole library that is like properly running. Um, each node of the tree can have features. So the features I decided to add to attach are the type of the content, the cookies. Um, the full body. Um, so I will just like attach all kind of information to my um, to my node uh, in the tree, so I can um, I can then search it later on. Uh, all the bodies in the tree are also uh, hashed, so I can also search for a hash in in the body. Um, and you can from from a specific node in the tree, you can also get ancestors uh, and children. Um, really easily. So, like when you when you search in the tree, like ET Toolkit has like all the libraries, all the uh, methods you need for that. You just get in your tree, get a particular node, and, and search search in it, and use it to figure out what has been from where it comes from and what is loaded from there. So that's pretty cool. Um, but still, I have at this point I have a huge tree containing like I don't know 800 URLs. 
Um, and those URLs are like, can be like hundreds of characters long. So it's really, really hard to represent them directly. Like you have a huge data set uh, containing files of information, but still not really useful. So what I decided to, to do at this point is to attach, uh, to, to like aggregate my URL by domains. So for each, for each URL, I look at the, the, sub, uh, the sub URLs attached uh, attach by domains and generate my tree out of that. Uh, and I aggregate the tree. So I, I also aggregate all the meta information for each domain. Um, so for example, if I say, OK, uh, this, uh, this domain is loading uh, three URLs. On, in all those URLs, I have like 10 cookies. Uh, and I have the content type and everything. And again, I made it a library because I like just making small libraries doing like one single thing. So you just like give, give to this one an HR file is going to give you an ET toolkit tree, um, which is already something that you can start to play with. But um, as you can imagine, um, a media lawyer, like around 60 plus year old, years old, uh, lawyer, you don't really want to tell them so. Now you need to open IPython and um, you're going to like uh, run a bunch of commands, get this HR file, uh, load, it in, uh, load it in the library, and then search, like, use some, uh, like, look at the documentation of ET Toolkit and do your thing. That's just not going to happen. Uh, so I really needed to have, like, something more, um, like, easier to, to play with and, uh, and much more, much. Like, like much more visual as to, to, to start to work on that. Um, so that's why uh, I also developed a web interface on top of it. Uh, so on the web interface, uh, I will make a demo just later, uh, you have like all the trees, you have like all the, all the nodes in, your, in the web interface. Um, you, so you can see like what is loading what, which domain is loading what. Um, you can collapse part of the tree. Let's say you see, okay, this part of the tree is like something I know I don't want to see it anymore. Just like collapse it, so it's going to be easier to, to work on. Um, you can expand from the from the host name. You can expand to the full URLs. Um, you, so you can see details for each URL, which kind of content they have in. Uh, if they are redirect and like just, you can have all the information you need from those particular URLs. And the other really cool thing is that you can get the body loaded by this particular URL uh, out of the tree. So let's say like you have somewhere in that tree some JavaScript is loaded. You want to just get the JavaScript to investigate it. You can just get it out of the, out of the tree, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I'm going to have a demo now. So if you want to look at it on, like, directly on your, own, um, uh, on your own computer, look into the circle I tell you is the domain uh, you can use for that. Uh, you won't be able to scrape a website because uh, I don't want you to blacklist the domain of uh, like one of the IP in, the, in our pool. Uh, but you can already look at a bunch, of, a bunch of examples. And I'm going to show you now what I have here locally. So. Um, so uh, again, this one is uh, the simple, the simple one. So just like you have, like you have like all this information here. But let's take something like a bit bigger. Let's go for um, let's go for LeMonde.fr. LeMonde.fr is still relatively reasonable. I mean, by relatively reasonable, I still mean it looks like that. And that's reasonable. I have words. Um, so as you can see here, you have like uh, my starting point. And my starting point here is uh, HTTPS lemonde.fr. I can just zoom a bit more into it. Um, and this one is uh, loading this one here, which is uh, www.lemonde.fr. And then this one is loading a bunch of other stuff. The icon here means that this one contains uh, an iframe. And I have like a bunch of other domains loaded, uh, not only from the iframe, but also from it. So. And then you have like stuff like that. And then you will relatively, relatively fast recognize some nodes like, like that, where you have a lot of stuff loaded out of it. So this one is like, most of the time, it's going to be some JavaScript uh, that is loading a bunch of subcomponent uh, doing a bunch of other stuff. So you will have like images. So images are most of the time uh, GIFs, like just like the one pixel GIFs that just are used for tracking. Uh, I don't have any way right now to display the cookies, but generally, like you have a bunch of cookies that are set and then read later on. And as you can see here, like all those bunch of redirects going in different websites, uh, I didn't investigate yet on like 
if all those websites are hosted by the same company, or if it's like a bunch of different companies exchanging uh, indicators about like the users. Um, but my assumption is that for those ones, um, it's p it's to um, uh, to identify which kind of browser you are using. Um, they just like redirect you from one domain to the other and do some testing to, to just like fingerprint uh, what's going on uh, on like what, which uh, which domain you which uh, browser you're using. Um, so again, Le Monde that here, so that's all the all the URLs I was able to attach to this particular node. And then I have a bunch of URLs down here that are not that I was not able to attach to anything. Um, those ones are. I guess uh, dynamically generated from somewhere in the tree. Um, on the referrer is stripped, so I don't have any way to do it, to do anything directly. Um, I mean, those ones also come from iframe, so I don't really know um, exactly what happened here. But still, that's that's like an interesting thing. And like those ones, you only have like four of them, or like three of them that I cannot attach to anything. But still, like when you click on those, on those, um, on those host name, you can just like look here and see all those really interesting URLs that I have no idea what they're doing. Let's be clear, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, something is going on here, but I need to investigate further. It's, um, it's right now really tricky to just figure out um, how that thing works. Um, so as I said, this one is relatively reasonable. I have worse. Um, like, this one is slightly worse. Uh, but like, oh no, this one, this one is relatively okay. Like at least everything uh, can, can be attached to the domain, and um, and yeah, it goes like relatively deep. But yeah, that's that's okay. -ish. Uh, like the, the really crazy one is going to be salon. So it's taking a while to load because <laughs> I have some stuff to, to do, and uh, this one looks like that. <laughs> so again. I have here, like, all oh, that's my orphans URLs. So those ones are, like, I wasn't able to attach them directly to my, to my node. But still, I have, like, the sub, uh, the sub part of, um, like, I was able to attach the sub URLs to one of my orphan URLs here. So, like, this one, for example, like, this domain is, I see it a lot uh, on uh, American websites, like uh, lygyt.com. And this one just loads everything. To like, I don't know. Like, I don't even know what they how what they are doing here. But like, that's six or seven level deep. Um, and again, all that stuff you see here. Um, generally, like most of us, we use um, ad blockers or we use uh, no scripts. So we will not load any of that, or we will load like a tiny sub part of it. Uh, but that's what um, like anyone else see, and that's why tracking is so insane on on websites nowadays. Um, so yeah, that's on, yeah something I didn't show you right now is that you can also when you when you click on on the domain here, and then you have the URL. If you click on it, it's going to download the content. So let's hope this one is working. Yeah. Um, whoops. Oh, that's, eh, Firefox just crashed. Um, so let's see if something happened here. OK, maybe not. Uh, why? OK, so that's, that's a way to, uh, to start investigating and like, seeing what's going on here. So this one was a redirect, loading some Google content uh, later on. So again, that's, that's going to be really interesting when you have some, some sketchy JavaScript um, you want to investigate. Because relatively often, you have like some, like, I would be an attacker. I find out some of those websites here that are like something, com something like vulnerable to uh, like vulnerable in here. Uh, compromise them, add something in like in a JavaScript that is loaded in here, and like do it every ten queries or something like that. Nobody will ever notice it. Like it's going to take a month before anyone starts investigates because investigating. Uh, but at least from here, I have 
all the parts of everything loaded from the websites, and I can then connect it to third party, um, third party services. I can start to connect it to VirusTotal. I can connect it to uh, tools like MISP. Um, I can do um, get into like passive DNS, passive SSL, just like figuring out what all those domains are doing. I can connect it to WIZ also, for example, to just see, okay, uh, who is the owner of like all those domains? Um, and then further on, like work on it and like have an idea of like what is going on. And that's a tool that at this point is not directly. I cannot really give it to a lawyer right now, but it's getting there. Like it's a, it's something that at some point we can imagine giving to non not too technical people willing to investigate their own websites. Uh, and at least they can start pinpointing domains that they are not expecting to see in that tree. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go back to the slides now, and then we will have some time later on if you have like specific uh, questions or domains you want me to to look up. Um, I bet you there will be some some questions here. So um, again, as I said, um, I want the UI of this tool being um, like usable and nice-ish. Uh, so that's what's what's going to happen in the next in the next versions. I'm going to like have a proper expansion box on the URLs. So uh, I don't have like a URL that is like uh, 150 characters long and uh, like really hard to understand and to read. But I, I want to have like a smaller box like that that I can expand the URLs uh, to compare them. It's also useful to have like when you have like five times the same or a URL really similar, you want to just like being able to see what the difference is. Um, like so being able to expand everything, being able to download all the contents of all those URLs um, to see what's going on. Um, and uh, then I also want to be able to um, uh, to add uh, more uh, more meta information in my tree. So like if I miss a referrer, like if the referrer has been stripped, but I found the, the uh, I found the way to connect to the tree from uh, a regex or um, I have like I want to have like more content types also displayed. Like, uh, do I have like flash content? Do I have an exe executable somewhere being downloaded? Uh, and like big warnings because like if an exe is downloaded, something bad is going on. Uh, or like a flash content, um, and I want to connect it to third-party services, so fish tank for example, just like to be able to look up uh, known malicious stuff. Um, I want to be able to compare uh, runs between different user agents. So let's say I run, I put a user agent of Firefox, I put a user agent of an old Firefox, I put a user agent of like Chrome that has known vulnerability, uh, and I want to just be able to see if the ad networks are responding differently depending on like what I give to what I what I just load, which kind of uh, content I'm loading. Um, and then uh, I want to be able to also crawl a website when I'm uh, logged in. For example, what's going on if I uh, start browsing Facebook, um, being logged in, and like having like what what is what is what will be loaded at the end. Um, and uh, after that, I also want to be able between different uh, runs, seeing okay, uh, which cookies are loaded from which websites. Uh, when I run, like when I open like three or four uh, different news websites, like if I if I if I open New York Times on BuzzFeed and uh, Guardian, um, which uh, which tracking network knows that I what I was what I was doing? Um, because I didn't investigate much in the cookies yet, but like the good practice is to reduce the access um, to a specific domain for a cookie. But in practice, it's open bar for everyone. Uh, like most of the time, it's just like the uh, the, limi the access limitation for the cookies is like star star. So it's like yeah, just open it. Like anyone gets the cookie and have fun with it. Um, uh, yeah, like if I have a cookie loaded, like set f by someone in my tree and like read by someone else, I also want to be able to see it. So like being able to click on the tree on a cookie and seeing where it's actually accessed um, at some other places will be really important. Um, yeah, so again, everything is open source. Everything is accessible on GitHub. Um, the demo instance uh, may be up or down, or uh, yeah, like I have no promises here that's going to stay up all the time. Um, it's again demo version. I really recommend you if you want to play with it. I really recommend you to install it locally on your machine and just like run it. Um, I just like install the Docker and run it. It's going to be like much easier for you. 
Um, and yeah, if you have any, like if you are like uh, JavaScript developer and you have like specific IDs and stuff you want to see happening and you want to implement in the, uh, in the web interface, I'm really happy, like just, I would like to have contributions. Um, and everything else is, very, is written in uh, Python, Python 3. So just, yeah, if you, are, if you want to contribute, I welcome um, pull requests. Um, so that was most of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, do you have questions or do you want me to give a try on some domains? Um, yeah. SAP.com. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see on the live instance. Um, So yeah, as you can see here, I also can also put the, the depth on the website. And the depth on the, website, on the website means I load the front page, and then I get all the links in that page containing sap.com in that case, and I go one, uh, one layer deeper. Um, if you put anything else than one, it's going to take a really long time, uh, but that's how it looks like right now. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not that bad. Like, it's, it's, I mean, it's like the same level as a news website. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's setting, it's reading quite a few cookies here. <laughs> I mean, probably all SAP cookies, but I don't know, like, uh, yeah. That's like all the domain, I mean, that's all uh, SAP.com domains. It's a bit, but I mean, it's, it's all fine. Like all those ones are just like uh, images from SAP. Um, and then you have like other things. Yeah, I mean, some are, yeah. Not SAP for sure, um, but yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's interesting to just like start to investigate and dig dig a bit more into it. Um, like if I get some JavaScript uh, that might be interesting somewhere. Uh, like for example, this one. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's like cookie pixel lib. That's oh, okay. Well, this one is probably empty. That's why it's not. Open yeah, sometimes, I mean, I still have a few bugs, as you may notice. Um, but yeah, for example, this one seems to contain some JSON somewhere. OK, well, it's just going to not work, obviously. Um, but yeah, do, uh, like, I mean, do you have other websites you want Can to? You give me one more, uh, one more the entire picture? Sure. <laughs> Uh, I did it on uh, lucid.circle.lu, so if you want to take a screenshot, like it's this one, you can access it uh, directly from your browser if you want. Like it's going to be just, uh, whoops, right here. So yeah, if you just go on the website, you can click here and you will see it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me call someone uh, over the mic that can answer questions. This one is, <laughs> this one is, this one's fine. Yes. I mean. <laughs> so yeah, like no cookie at all. Um, yeah. Can you try build.de? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I already tested this one at some point. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it's. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. This one has, yeah, a few. I mean, again, it's, it's interesting, needs further investigation, but like, it's, yeah. It's a, it's a good way to uh, just start looking at those websites and see, okay, what, what, like, what do I want? What, what is expected, what isn't expected on those websites uh, in a way that it's not just like a full blob of thing out of, um, uh, in, your, uh, in your browser uh, debug, uh, or like, yeah, uh, debug uh, interface. Um, yeah. The deployed version that you have requires your credentials. But if we run it locally, we can run it without the 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like if you if you install everything locally uh, on your machine, uh, it's just I don't want to have uh, people putting like a domain on like ten ten level deep and like getting the IP blacklisted because it's just like downloading a whole website. Yeah. Yes. So my assumption is these guys, no matter what they are, they are processing my IP. This is person identified in front of me. They are a data controller, so they are in charge to get this to process this data. Yes. So I didn't expect these are these guys hey, to take responsibility for this crash that they are delivering, or they should be challenging for. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that would be interesting to start asking, uh, asking lawyers. Uh, this, this is Mm -hmm. so this gives them some kind of leverage to argue with management yeah. why this should be a little bit damped down. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that's really important. That's, but like having a tool like that to just like show them what's going on is also like making, making the problem much clearer for them. So they have also some leverage on like the uh, marketing department that just wants to run everything and get as much information as, uh, as possible about their users. Like if, you, if you pick any of those domains in those pages and start contacting, um, contacting the, the website or build at build.de or something uh, to ask about them, that's going to be really interesting. <coughs> Uh, yeah, and um, the wall, the JavaScript library I'm using to display the tree is called d3.js, which is a really good library for that. So I just like give it a bunch of uh, big JSON blob, and it displays the wall tree. Um, yeah, if it's taking too long, it's also possible that the backend is just not working anymore. Uh, I can just do it. I can just do it locally here. That's going to work probably faster. Maybe some questions in the meantime. Yeah. Are there some questions? Everybody's blown away <laughs> and shocked. Did you get some of uh, Sorry? Did you get some of black for scanning? Um, not yet, as far as I know. Um, I mean, it may happen. But uh, I mean, I'm basically just loading one page. Like I'm not really doing anything. It's the same as if I would be opening the URL in my browser. So it's, it's not really doing much more than that. I mean, it's not doing anything else than that. Um, but yeah, so that's RT. Um, it's, yeah, it's loading stuff. Um, OpenX.net is relatively common. I've seen it quite a lot. Um, I mean, you have double click all the time. I mean, everyone is using Google, basically. Um, What's that EXE file? Sorry? What's that EXE file? Uh, uh, is there an EXE file somewhere? No. I didn't. Oh, is it? Do you mean here? Legend, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a legend, yeah, yeah. So it's just, yeah. Um, no, there is no, like, I don't think there's an EXE file. I didn't see any EXE file in the uh, in a tree. But yeah, it's just, if that happens, I have like a detection for that. Um, but yeah, like some stuff we see relatively often is also uh, like for, like library like jQuery, uh, minified because all those JavaScript stuff are minified all the time. So it's basically one single line of like everything. Um, so when attacker just like replace jQuery by like their own jQuery containing some malicious content somewhere in the middle, figuring out what's going on is again complicated. So I want to. Um, I will, I will create a database of like known um, JavaScript libraries. I just have the hash and look it up against everything I have in the tree to see if I have like known legitimate content. So you can just like, discard it uh, when you want because that's again relatively common. Uh, 
what do you mean? The, like the trigger, like where it comes from, or what? Uh, yeah, what? So in the yeah. origin, yeah. In that point, we have yeah. mm -hmm. this JavaScript from this URL, and it was triggered by. Uh, so, so I'm wondering yeah. why these orphan elements are there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure out what where that comes from. Like it's. Um, Generally, the way the, um, uh, the debug, uh, like the developer uh, tab of the, of the browser works is by looking at the same stuff as I'm doing with um, referrer or, um, or the location header. But <coughs> something is going to, sometimes it's going to be removed. So yeah, that would be like, I need to, I need to, look, at, to look it up and see where that comes from. But like, as everything is JavaScript asynchronous and so on, like it's possible to hide it relatively easily, and I have quite a few domains that just like quite a few um, cases where the URL loaded is loaded uh, is dynamically constructed in the JavaScript, um, and the uh, the referrer is removed from the HTTP header, and I'm like yeah that just I have no idea where that comes from. I mean, it it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean. I need to look it up more in the, um, in the uh, developer tools. I had cases where I, I literally have no idea what has been, what triggered that. Um, but yeah. I mean, definitely needs improvement. It's like, it's work in progress. But yeah, um, I mean, bug reports and so on, I'm definitely looking forward to, yeah, to improve it. Uh, right now, I cannot change from web interface or user agent. And so I put like, I put, like the, one of the most recent Chrome uh, Chrome user agent in here, but like really soon I will just like add mo one more field to uh, to just like have a list of user agents to uh, to run it uh, and to give it to to just see the difference. One more question. Yeah. You mentioned, um, you're basically instrumenting a Docker image with Python. Uh, so the Docker. Uh, Uh, no, 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 it's, uh, it's Splash. So uh, the tool in the Docker image is called Splash. And like, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's like you can just get it from, uh, from the Splash developers. Yes, so what, what I'm wondering is if it would be possible to put in a proxy. Mm -hmm. so because then you would, you, you would have a list of the full URLs of mm -hmm. the you could trust the mesh uh, details. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could do that. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, it's, um, I think, uh, Splash can get a proxy. You can configure it. Um, like, Splash is, like, really, really big, and you have a lot of options. Um, yeah. Need to, need to investigate a bit further, but, yeah, that's, that's most probably possible. Yeah. And then you can also, like, redirect, like, if you want to, like, if you want to uh, load a page from a specific uh, IP, you can also, like, if you have a proxy, you can just, like, use that. Uh, to just like give a try from like RT from uh, from Russia, Russia and RT from the US and see if there's any difference. There is probably some interesting stuff here, but yeah. I would have another question. Yeah. Uh, do you plan to implement uh, a filter for the specific items so I see uh, everything where JavaScript is mm. used? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like that, the idea will be to be able to click on the um, down here on the on the legend and just like to only display stuff with JavaScript, for example. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's not implemented yet, but yeah, that's, that's the plan. Uh, and then clicking on, like, when you have a cookie, you can just click on the cookie. I need to figure out how I can do that in the tree because it's a bit more, more complicated, but like, I have one cookie, I want to be able to click on it and see where it's loaded in my tree because that's also going to be really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you just like, also, uh, there are filtering. It's possible to, um, in Splash itself, to pass um, uh, block lists the same as the ones you have in uh, uBlock, for example, microBlock. You can just like get the get the, the list, the block list, put it in a directory, and the, in, or pass it to uh, to Splash when you do the query, and automatically blacklist those domains. So if you want to use, if you want to see the difference between uh, with a NAT blocker and without a NAT blocker, you can also do that in Splash directly. Um, no more questions? Thank you very much.